This is the third Honeywell Pneumatic training video. It will cover basic thermostat construction and operation, then go into detail about calibrating a Honeywell TP970 thermostat. As we learned earlier in the series, a pneumatic control system must have a source of clean, dry, oil-free air at a constant pressure and of adequate volume for correct operation. When the air is compressed and cooled below its saturation point, moisture condenses. This water accumulates in the tank, so it needs to be drained. The tank may have an auto drain with a float or may be operated by a timer. This drain should be routinely checked to ensure it is working properly. Draining the tank helps dry the air. However, an air dryer is often needed to ensure that the air is dry enough so that condensation does not occur in the tubing. Air dryers also have drains that should be checked to ensure that the air dryer is working correctly. Airborne particles and oil mist can cause problems in a pneumatic system. Particles can block airflow, of course, but when oil collects in orifices and small passages, it can foul equipment and shorten its life. To remove oil mist, an oil coalescing filter is used. These usually have a drain at the bottom of a glass bowl and will need service once solid particles plug up the filter. Usually an increase in pressure drop across the filter, about 10 psi, indicates that the filter element needs to be replaced. After passing through the filter, the air enters the pressure reducing valve. This limits the outlet pressure to typically between 18 and 25 psi, depending on the system. Some systems use a pressure reducing valve that can be set to deliver one of two preset pressures. Usually these are 13 or 18 psi for Honeywell equipment, but other manufacturers use other pressures between 15 and 25 psi. The switchover from one pressure to the other may be triggered by a time clock. This is often used for temperature setback in a day-night system. Or it may switch over manually between summer and winter. The pressure reducing valve is usually in the mechanical room. But in larger buildings, the air is delivered to various parts of the building at high pressure. Then PRVs are used to control pressure at the remote locations, the distant wings or floors of the building. In general, before considering the calibration of any controller, ensure that the supply of air is clean and dry and at the correct pressure. The air that leaves the pressure reducing valves is called main supply air. It goes out to each of the thermostats and controllers in the system. Inside the pneumatic controller is a simple but effective device called a nozzle flapper. It provides a way to bleed off supply air to deliver a modulated output control signal in the branch line. This air pressure in the branch line is a modulating output signal that operates valve or damper actuators or pneumatic relays. Let's look at how this device works. Here you can see the nozzle flapper assembly. The nozzle allows air to bleed off, reducing pressure downstream. The flapper sits over the nozzle and blocks or allows air to bleed off. Above the flapper is the bimetal. The bimetal is an element that bends in response to room temperature, which pushes the flapper to a certain distance from the nozzle, controlling the bleed rate. This diagram is of a two-pipe thermostat installation. In a two-pipe installation, the main air tubing and the branch line tubing is connected directly to the thermostat. The ports on the back of the thermostat are marked M and B. Notice that the restrictor and nozzle flapper assembly are both part of the thermostat. Much like our earlier diagram, the air first passes through the restrictor, then to the nozzle where it is allowed to bleed off. The restrictor limits the supply of air to the thermostat to be no more than can be bled off by the nozzle. This makes it possible for the thermostat to control the branch line pressure. The restrictor has a very small hole in it, about the width of a human hair. So if the air supply is not clean and dry, it can get plugged and not allow air to pass. So the main air supply enters the thermostat and goes past the restrictor, then to a pipe with the nozzle. As the bimetal bends in response to room temperature, the flapper moves to control the bleed rate. The rate of air bleed then creates a pressure in the branch line that corresponds to the room temperature. The branch line is connected to an actuator with a valve or damper. As the temperature varies, 
so does the actuator position. The valve or damper modulates to a position in proportion to the room's temperature. This diagram is a little different. It represents a one-pipe thermostat installation. Same thermostat, just a different installation. In a one-pipe installation, the restrictor, obtained separately, is in the main air supply, not inside the thermostat. The main air port on the stat is blocked. But the nozzle flapper operation remains the same as in our previous descriptions. Again, all the air lines after the restrictor will assume the air pressure value that develops at the thermostat's nozzle. So the air pressure developed in the stat is also the air pressure in the branch line and in the actuator. And a valve or damper connected to this actuator will then modulate in proportion to the room's temperature change. There are other ways controllers may sense temperature, but all have the same means of sensing ambient temperature and then moving the flapper to control the branch line pressure. Why the option of one pipe or two pipe installation? When would we need one or the other? The top diagram is a two pipe installation. In this case, the main air comes into the room from the hallway and connects to the stat on the wall. The branch line then runs across the room to operate a valve on the far side of the room. The lower diagram is a one pipe installation. In this case, the main air comes in from the hallway with a valve located on the same side of the room but the thermostat is located on the far side of the room. So only one run of tubing to the thermostat is needed. Notice the little tick marks on the piping lines in these diagrams? They denote that the runs are pneumatic lines on the drawing and not water or electric lines. This is a takeoff from way back in time when pneumatic piping runs were actually small diameter copper pipes with sweat soldered fittings. So the use of this one pipe installation method makes more sense when we think about running expensive copper all around the building. Not quite as important from an economic standpoint with today's quick and easy plastic tubing. Thus, two pipe installations seem to be the norm today. Thermostats are available in low capacity or high capacity models. This diagram shows the main air supply passing through a restrictor before going into the branch line. This is a low capacity thermostat. With these, a low volume of air passes through that restrictor, and therefore the actuator responds slowly to change. It simply takes time for it to fill the volume of the actuator diaphragm. And the larger the actuator, the slower the response. In most cases, HVAC loads change relatively slowly, so the low capacity stat depicted here often keeps up just fine, particularly with smaller actuators. TP973 are low capacity pneumatic thermostats. If faster changing loads are encountered, especially when using larger actuators, then high capacity stats should be considered. The branch line output of a high capacity thermostat responds very quickly due to the addition of a flow amplifier. In this case, main air still travels through the restrictor to the nozzle bleed, but it also flows to a flow amplifier module prior to the restrictor. The nozzle pressure acts against a flow amplifier diaphragm, which repeats the signal into the branch line with high volume air from the main air supply. This then positions actuators quickly, providing fast response to changing loads and larger actuators. Most installations today use high capacity thermostats, such as the TP970 or TP971 day night stats, and most others. Here's another option that needs to be considered when selecting a thermostat. The thermostat can be either direct acting or reverse acting. The direct acting thermostat has a direct temperature to output pressure relationship. As the sense temperature goes up, the outlet pressure goes up. The reverse acting controller has a reverse temperature to output pressure relationship. As the sense temperature goes up, the output pressure goes down. When do we need one or the other? It depends on the control action of the application and the normally open, normally closed configuration of the actuator. For example, a fan coil unit in a room with a normally open valve needs a direct acting thermostat. Why? Because as the temperature goes down, the valve must open to heat the room. And a normally open valve opens as the air pressure to it falls. So as the room temperature falls, the branch line pressure must also fall to open the valve. Here's the same heating loop, but with a normally closed valve. As the temperature falls in the room, we need to add heat, so the valve needs to open. 
And normally a closed valve needs air pressure to open. So as the temperature falls, the output branch line pressure must rise to open the valve. Thus, a reverse acting thermostat is needed. The operation and calibration of pneumatic controllers makes more sense when we thoroughly understand proportional control principles. Let's start with some terms. Set point is the desired temperature, of course, and control point is the current room temperature. The difference between these two temperatures is called offset. The next term is throttling range. Throttling range is found in all modulating control systems from pneumatic to modern DTC systems. Throttling range is the change in degrees that will cause the valve to go from full open to full closed. In this example, it's set at four degrees. So with a set point of 70 degrees, the throttling range is 68 to 72 degrees. When the room temperature, the control point, is within the throttling range, the valve or damper will modulate to a partially open position. And when it's above or below the throttling range, the valve or damper will be fully open or fully closed. We've seen how temperature changes make the biobental increase or decrease the nozzle gap bleed rate. This bleed rate will rise and fall in proportion to the room temperature change. So, as the temperature falls, indicating an increased heat load, a direct acting thermostat will make the branch line pressure fall. A normally open valve will modulate towards open, giving us more heat. Or conversely, as the room temperature rises and the pressure increases, the valve will modulate towards closed, delivering less and less heat. In this example, the temperature fell over a period of time from 71 to 70.5 degrees. The branch line pressure fell to about 9 psi, causing the normally open valve to open a little further. This increased the hot water flow rate, and the heating coil increased BTUs delivered to replace the increased BTU loss. And as long as the heat loss remains constant, the offset stays constant, and the valve stays at a position that reflects this load. In this example, it's currently one half of a degree. If the heating load increases because the rate of BTU loss from the building increases, the room temperature will drop further. If the temperature falls to 69 degrees, the bleed rate will increase and the branch line pressure will drop to about five and a half pounds, causing the valve to open further to about three quarters open. This increases the rate of BTU transfer into the room to replace the BTU loss that caused the temperature to fall to 69 degrees. We now have a one degree offset, and it will stay that way until the heating load increases or decreases. Proportional control matches the heat replacement to the heat loss. Proportional control is best for large buildings where the temperature changes slowly. Remember, in proportional control, we always have an amount of offset reflective of the load on the control system. So a proportional controller really does not hold its set point. However, with the correct throttling range, the offset seldom gets more than one degree above or below set point, an amount that's hardly perceptible. This graph shows the effect of two throttling ranges, one of four degrees and the other of 12 degrees. Remember that throttling range is the number of degrees above and below set point over which the valve or damper goes from full close to full open. The thermostat can be adjusted to change the throttling range. In general, a small throttling range will make the system respond faster because a small temperature change will cause a large change to damper or valve position. A smaller throttling range will reduce offset and keep the room temperature closer to the set point. But this can also cause the system to overshoot above and below set point. Although some oscillation is normal with proportional control, too much is called hunting and should be avoided because it accelerates wear and tear on mechanical equipment. The larger the throttling range, the slower the system will respond because a change in room temperature will result in a small change in damper or valve position. Systems that are subject to abrupt changes in load or set point typically require a wider throttling range. The throttling range can be adjusted on the thermostat. The range is different on different thermostats, but many thermostats allow the throttling range to be adjusted from 2 to 10 degrees. The right setting is based on the thermostat and the system. Many are set at 4 degrees from the factory. The valve position follows the temperature. In this example, as in the last, as the room temperature slowly falls, the pressure decreases, causing the valve to open, 
which causes an increase in hot water flow to replace heat loss. Remember, it was the change in temperature that changed the valve position. Next, I will cover calibrating pneumatic thermostats. To keep the explanation simple, I will show how to calibrate using direct acting thermostats with normally open valves, using Honeywell TP970 thermostats. Please always refer to manufacturer's instructions for detailed steps based on your application and your equipment. There are two methods that are used to calibrate pneumatic thermostats. Method one is often used and is usually the method described in control theory books. It simply calibrates the output to 8 psi calibration pressure, which is the center of a pneumatic controller's typical 3 to 13 pound branch line output, and the center of the thermostat's throttling range. The second method calibrates the thermostat to the spring range of the actuator. In this example, the spring range of the actuator is 8 to 13 pounds. So the calibration pressure is midpoint at 10.5 pounds. A direct acting thermostat with a normally open valve will open with lower pressure. So an actuator with a range of 8 to 13 pounds would be fully open at the 8 pounds that method 1 calibrated at 70 degrees. Method 2 calibrates to a halfway open valve. It is calibrated to midway through the actuator spring range, 10.5 pounds in this case. And the actuator at midway means the valve is halfway open. So the valve is halfway open at the center of the desired control temperature range and throttles around the calibration temperature. This method controls the valve to meet the true load range as indicated by the sensed temperature. It's probably used more often in duct coil control loops, but many professionals choose this method for local loop room control as well. Both methods work, and you can choose which is best. Let's now go through how to calibrate using both methods. Before you calibrate, make sure you're getting enough air to the stat. The recommended main air pressure is usually 17 to 22 pounds, and it almost always needs to be at least 14 pounds. Check main air pressure by removing the stat from the wall and inserting a branched tap gauge into the main air port on the exposed back plate. It's marked with an M. If the main air pressure is low, some of the things to check include air leaks, crimped tubing, dirty filters, or an incorrectly set pressure reducing valve. Also make sure the stat is operational. A quick test is to simply give the bimetal a couple of quick flicks to see if the branch line tap gauge needle bounces. If the thermostat is dusty, use a soft brush to clean the inside of the thermostat. Be sure that the throttling plate nozzle assembly is clean. There is no need to lubricate the thermostat. Also be sure to check if this is a direct acting or reverse acting thermostat, because the steps are slightly different for each. In this example, we're using a direct acting stat. A better operational check will determine if the thermostat can produce a full branch pressure output. Insert your branch line tap gauge and then turn the set point knob at least five degrees high and then five degrees low from where it was set. Can you see the branch line pressure rise and fall at least from three to 13 pounds? If not, the stat may be defective, in which case it cannot be calibrated, or there may not be sufficient main air pressure. Here are the steps to calibrate. Step one, you've already done, verify the main air supply at the stat. Keep in mind that main air pressure will vary quite a bit around the building due to pressure drops, but it should remain somewhat constant at a given location. Next, remove the cover and insert a branch line tap gauge into the tap port at the top of the stat. Then, measure the ambient room temperature with a reliable thermometer. Do not use the built-in thermometer on the thermostat. In this example, the room temperature is 70 degrees. Next, turn the set point dial to the ambient temperature. Then, simply adjust the small brass calibration screw to get a reading of 8 psi on the branch gauge. Note that if the built-in thermometer on the stat is reading inaccurately, it can be adjusted to reflect true room temperature. After adjusting the calibration screw, we should check the throttling range. For this, we use the slider button on the bimetal. Remember that the throttling range is the temperature change that will cause the output pressure to go from open to closed, 3 to 13 psi in this example. A 4 degree throttling range is shown in this line graph. In this case, as the temperature drops 2 degrees to 68 degrees, the pressure will drop to 3 pounds. An increase of 2 degrees will increase it to 13 pounds. To check this setting, we adjust the set point dial 2 degrees above set point to 72 degrees. 
The branch pressure should drop to around 3 pounds. Next, we adjust the set point dial 2 degrees below set point to 68 degrees. The branch pressure should rise to around 13 pounds. Repeat these steps again to verify that a 4 degree temperature change will produce approximately 3 to 13 pound change on the gauge. If a tighter throttling range is desired, then carefully adjust the sliding brass throttling range pin found on the thermoset's bimetal strip. Repeat the steps to verify the new throttling range setting. Anytime the throttling range is adjusted, you'll need to recheck the 8 pound calibration point. Move the set point dial back to 70 degrees and readjust the brass calibration screw if necessary. Then recheck the throttling range again by raising and lowering the set point 2 degrees to verify the 3 to 13 pound output change and readjust if needed. The thermostat is now calibrated. Be sure to set the set point dial to the desired set point before leaving the room. Remember, right now it is set at the ambient room temperature that we use for calibration. And that may not be the desired room temperature. You'll use the same procedures to calibrate other models of thermostats. And in fact, the procedure for calibrating the RP920A is surprisingly similar to the TP970. The alternate method of calibrating the thermostat, method 2, is to calibrate it to the center of the actuator spring range. In this example, the spring range is 8 to 13 pounds, as indicated on the actuator's product tag. The calibration steps are the same with the exception of step 5. That was the one where we set the calibration screw to the pressure at the middle of the throttling range. In this case, we adjust the calibration screw to the pressure midway through the actuator spring range. So here we set the screw until the gauge reads 10.5 pounds because that's halfway between 8 and 13 pounds. Then when you test the throttling range, verify that the valve or actuator is closed at 8 pounds and is open at 13, as this is the spring range of the actuator. This concludes Pneumatics 3, Thermostats. In today's video, we looked at proportional control with pneumatic thermostats, how to verify they are working properly, and how to calibrate them. You can find more information on Honeywell's pneumatic controls at customer.honeywell.com. Here you will find brochures, installation instructions, and the pneumatic controls manual.